Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the scriptures. Thank you that this is your inspired revelation to us. Lord, we need your spirit to understand it. Give us your spirit. Illumine the text. Illumine our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you brought your Bibles, if you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 2. If you didn't bring your Bibles, if you'd grab a pew Bible, and we'll look at that together. Um, when I was in college, I lent my girlfriend $100. And three years later, when we separated and broke up, she gave me back exactly $100. I have to confess, I lost interest in that relationship. <laughs> Thank you. Matthew thought it was funny, the rest of you, whatever, okay. All right. New Testament scholar in England by the name of C.H. Dodd used to talk about this idea of the kerygma. The kerygma is the kernel, the nub of the gospel. What is the gospel? Ephesians chapter 2 overflows with the gospel. Now, we understand the gospel in part, but there's another piece of the gospel which may have escaped your notice. If we go back and we look in the New Testament, or if we read in ancient history, it doesn't come as a surprise to us that there was alienation, that there was separation. The Jews didn't get along with the Gentiles, the Romans and the Greeks didn't get along with the Jews, and this is the story of both the Old and the New Testament, that there is this separation, this alienation that's taking place. The Jews said of the Gentiles, they're dogs. That's how they felt about them. They believed the Gentiles existed to fuel the fires of hell. That's the only reason for Gentiles to even be in the world. They said that a good snake constricts, it squeezes, and the best a good Gentile can do is to kill. Um, they're barbarians, they're animals. That was the belief of the Jews. Now, the Greeks and the Romans were, had the same parochial hatreds that the Jews had. Uh, Plato said that the barbarians, and by that he meant anybody who wasn't Greek and anybody who wasn't like him, the barbarians are by nature my enemy. And Pliny, the Roman historian, said of the Greeks, that they waged an unceaseless war against the barbarians, those that are different than they are. And yet, if he'd looked in the mirror, he'd realize that that was also true of imperial Rome. And so that there are these differences that we have with one another. Paul tells us about these differences in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. He says, there's neither male nor female, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither Jew nor Greek, that we are all one in Christ. He sums up in that one verse what he's going to tell us here in Ephesians chapter 2, but he's going to unpack it further, make it clearer to us. If you begin with me, I, I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11 is the beginning of our text, and it starts with the word, therefore. Whenever you see the word, therefore, yes, you find out what it's there for. And so in the Greek, it's a conjunction. And so verses 1 through 10 are tied with this word, therefore, to verses 11 through 22. And Paul is going to explain to us the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel we understand, mostly. So if you look at verses 1 through 3, it is you're dead in your trespasses and sin. It begins with bad news. We're, we're a mess. Uh, we're a hot mess, and so that's the problem. And then if you look at verse 4, it, has, it begins with these words, but God. So it's bad news, and we're in a pickle, we're dead in our trespasses and sins, but God, and then in verses 4 through 7, God does something about our predicament, and then in verses 8 through 10 are the implications for our lives of what we're supposed to do about that. Well, the gospel is running on a parallel track. What Paul says, or the outline that Paul follows in verses 1 through 10, is exactly the same outline he follows in verses 11 through 22. It begins with with bad news, which we'll get to in just a moment, and then in verse 13, it's parallel to verse 4, but, in, but now in Christ, but God, in verse 4, but now in Christ, and so then God is going to do something about our predicament, 
And then there are implications for the gospel to our lives. What does that mean to us? What does that mean today? What does that mean for my life? Well, in verse 10, Paul says, you are my, the Greek word is poema, you are my poem. You are my masterpiece. You are this wonderful thing, my creation that I have done for what purpose? For good works that you should walk in them. Now we get our individual personal salvation. For many people, you say the sinner's prayer, you bought your fire insurance, you're not going to go to hell, and then you can live like hell. And that's just, that's just the good news of the gospel, that we're saved by grace through faith. Paul is saying that this is the gospel also, and it is just as essential as we are saved by grace through faith. He's running a parallel track, and that this is also the gospel, and this is also essential, and very seldom do we hear the gospel preached the way Paul is going to preach it in verses 11 through 22. But the outline is exactly the same as 1 through 10. So as we look at this together, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by the flesh in the hands, by hands. There was this alienation. There was this hostility. There was this enmity. And the problems that we have in our day and time are no different than they were in the ancient world. They're no more intractable today than they were in the ancient world. Democrats and Republicans don't get along. They don't speak the same language. They don't have the same worldview. Jews and Gentiles in the ancient world, all of that was true of them. Um, and so God is going to speak into this brokenness. He's going to speak into to this enmity, this hatred, this hostility that people have one for another. The Jews, proud of their circumcision, called the Gentiles dogs. They looked down on them. The Gentiles considered the Jews the enemy of humanity. You think anti-Semitism is a new thing? No. The Greeks hated the Jews. The Romans hated the Jews. Why? The Jews wouldn't go along to get along. They called them atheists. They believed in Yahweh, the God of Israel, but they wouldn't worship any of the gods on the pantheon. They wouldn't worship the emperor. Therefore, Jews are atheists. And so the Jews considered the Greeks atheists. The atheists considered, or the Greeks considered the, the, the Jews atheists. Everybody was mad at everybody else. That's as relevant as pick up the newspaper or watch the, the news. That's, that's what's going on in our world. And here's the good news of the gospel. Verse 13, but God. But we'll get there in a minute. We're not there yet. All right, verse 11. Verse 12. Now, here is the bad news. And it, there's five things that Paul says about the Gentiles. Now, I want you to see that in verse 11, he uses the word Gentile. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, he uses that word again. These are the places where Paul uses the word. And scholars say, as a result, particularly verse, chapter 3, verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ, on behalf of you Gentiles. His church in Ephesus was largely a Gentile church, almost exclusively a Gentile church. So he's not writing this to the Jews, he's writing this to the Gentiles. The Jews have made it very clear where they stand. You're not, you're not a Jew, we hate you. Um, Jeff Dunham, and he's got that, that um, puppet that's... Um, the, Ahmed, yes, Ahmed. Silence! I kill you! That's, that's essentially... The, the attitude that they had toward one another in the ancient world. Now, Paul's writing to these Gentiles, and he says, Now, here's your bad news. He did our bad news, or he did the Jews' bad news in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now, here's your bad news. Five things that Paul says about them. He says that you were at one time separated from Christ, that you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, you were alienated from God's people. That you were strangers to the covenants and promises of God. They didn't have God's word. They didn't have scripture. They didn't understand what God was doing in the world. They had all these other gods that they worshipped and tried to give some meaning and purpose to their lives, but they didn't get what the true God, the creator of the world, had planned for them. 
And then they were hopeless. And then they were godless. These are the five significant problems that the Gentiles had. Again, Paul is rehearsing the gospel in, in parallel tracks from 1 through 3. And then in verse 13, it begins with the good news again. Where's 13? There. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The Jews, my people, have rejected you, but I haven't rejected you. And just like the Jews were made right with me by the blood of the Messiah, so the Gentiles are made right with me. This is the gospel. He's telling the gospel again. Now we get the gospel in the first half of the chapter. You were saved by grace through faith. And the you is in the third person singular. Almost all the New Testament, the yous are plural. Talking about all y'alls. But in Ephesians 2, at the beginning of the chapter, it's you individually, about a personal salvation. And I think in America, we get that. Do you have Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And, you know, you, you know the language, you know how that goes. But Paul is now explaining something that we don't understand about the gospel. It is just as essential as my personal salvation that God is at work on us communally, that God is at work on us as the people of God corporately, not just individually. And so here we go in verse uh, 14. He says, where is 14? But when, I, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I'm reading chapter, that's, oh, that's Galatians, I flipped the page. Gentiles eat pork chops, I can find it. There we go. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. But he himself is our shalom. Peace in that world was not the absence of conflict. It wasn't the absence of war. It was human thriving. It was fullness. It was completeness. It was health. It was welfare. It was all of those things all rolled up into one. For Jesus, He Himself is our shalom, who has made us both one. Wait, but there's this wall of enmity that stands between us. A couple years ago in the state of Michigan, Lodi, Michigan, there was a guy by the name of Wayne Lambart, and he got into an argument with his neighbor. His neighbor was a farmer. His house backed up to the farmer's field, and they had a dispute about the property line. Well, the farmer had had enough of Wayne Lambart, and so he built a wall made from his cow's manure. A cow patty wall, 250 feet long across the back of Wayne Lambart's backyard, stunk to high heaven. And Wayne Lambart went to the town fathers who wouldn't give him a whiff of help. Because as long as the wall was on the farmer's land, there was nothing they could do. And the farmer didn't like Wayne, and Wayne called it a poop wall. And the farmer said, it's not a poop wall, it's a compost fence. We have, in this world, broken relationships. We build walls between us and other people. And what Paul is telling us here is that Jesus, in His body, in His flesh, has torn down these walls of hostility that exist between people. In the ancient world, the figure of the wall was a real thing, a legitimate thing. In the temple in Jerusalem, there was the temple. And you go inside the temple courts, and the first court is the court of the Gentiles. That's where the Jews were selling animals. That's where they were exchanging currency. That's where Jesus whipped them and drove them out of the temple courts because that was a place for Gentiles to come in and get closer to God. And the Jews took it over in order to make money. And so Jesus drove them out. And in that, on that wall, before, okay, so first there's the wall of the Gentiles, then there's the court of the Gentiles, the court of women. Once you pass through that wall, the court of women, Jewish women, the court of men, 
Then there was the altar and the place of sacrifice, and then behind that, within that precinct, was the Holy of Holies where God himself lived. And so the Gentiles could enter into the temple precincts, into the court of the Gentiles, but according to Josephus, there was a sign on the wall in Latin and in Greek that said you can go no farther. And if you enter into the temple beyond this point, the temple of the court of the Gentiles, it's punishable by death. If we find you beyond this wall, we will kill you. Um, that's, that's the way the world is. We have our boundaries. We have our, uh, our uh, borders. And if you cross over them or pass through them, then there's heck to pay. And that wall was torn down by Jesus' death on the cross. You remember when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. That made it possible for all human beings to have a relationship with God. God no longer dwelt in a temple made by human hands, Acts 26, 17. He no longer dwelt in a physical building, but that God was free to go and roam the whole world and that everybody in the world was now free to have the potential for a relationship with the true God. In the same way, that's a vertical relationship, in the same way this horizontal relationship made it possible for people who are at enmity with one another, hostility toward one another, hatred toward one another, it made it possible to be in relationship, to be reconciled to them. There is no place in the kingdom for racism, no place in the kingdom for sexism, no place in the kingdom for all of these divisions that we manufacture to make us different than other people and to keep people at arm's length. Jesus has destroyed all of that by his death on the cross. This is the gospel. This is just as essential as my personal salvation that we are together corporately the people of God. And so Paul goes on, verses 15 through 18, is an exposition of a verse from the uh, prophet Isaiah. Isaiah gives this prophecy in the Old Testament. Chapter 57, verse 19, he says this, Peace, peace, remember that, is shalom. It's wholeness, it's completeness, it is thriving, it is... Uh, it, all things are operating the way that they were created to operate. All, everything is good. Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. Peace, peace to the far. He's offering shalom to those who are far off, to the Gentiles. I'm sure the Jews, when they heard Isaiah prophesy that, weren't happy about what he was saying. What, they share in the promises that God has given to us? He's our God, and His blessings are our blessings, and now we have to share them with the Gentiles. Peace, peace to those who are far and to those who are near. You get the same shalom, you get the same blessings, you get the same benefits. How? I, the Lord, will heal. God will bridge this gap. God will heal the gap. New Testament word for that is sozo. Sozo means also God will heal, but also He will deliver, He will rescue, He will save. That word means all of those things. And so when God says, I will heal, He's also saying, I will deliver the Gentiles, I will save the Gentiles, I will rescue the Gentiles, as well as the Jews. The Jews understood that applied to them, but they couldn't get their head around the idea that, wait a minute, you're talking about the Gentile dogs? How could that possibly be? Well, that's what Paul's talking about in 15 through 18. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that, might, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. There was an early church father by the name of Diag Diagnetus. Um, and Diagnetus said that God has created a new race. It's neither Jew nor Gentile. Christians are a completely new race. Paul says essentially the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter um, 5, verse 17. Therefore, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. You are a new creation. That there is a new humanity. We're reconciled to one another. There are no differences. There are no separations. There is no enmity between us and people who are not like us if we are in Christ. That's the gospel. 
You don't hear that preached very often, but that's the gospel. That's an essential part of the gospel. This is the same kind of proclamation that Paul is making in verses 1 through 10. You're dead in your trespasses and sin, but God has done something in Jesus Christ. You're saved by grace through faith. We all understand that. How is it that we don't understand the corporate implications of the gospel? Because this is just as essential as my personal salvation. So Paul continues. Verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Jew or Gentile, black or white, male or female, slave or free, doesn't matter. We have access to the Father by his spirit. He pours out his spirit on us individually. He pours out his spirit on us corporately. Where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. How? By his spirit, which he pours out on all of us together. Verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens. Paul is using an understanding of the ancient Roman world that we might not get. I moved here from York, Pennsylvania. I lived in the commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and I moved to a state. Commonwealth is a political entity that exists for the benefit of all of its citizens. All of its citizens, the state is just a political entity, but it doesn't exist for the benefit of all, it's not a commonwealth. Now remember back earlier in the chapter, verse, what number was that? Verse, alienated, verse 12, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. God's community, God's people exist for the benefit of one another. And then he talks about being fellow citizens of that commonwealth. We all share in the blessings. We all share in the benefits of what God is doing in and through his son, Jesus Christ. And so he says, verse 19 again, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. In other words, you are no longer illegal immigrants. Now you got a green card. But you are fellow citizens. Oh, you don't have a green card. You're a citizen. You're a citizen of the family of God, the household of God. We'll get to that in a minute. You are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You've been invited into his home. You are adopted as his child. You and everybody else who shares his name being in Christ, being a Christian, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. What's that mean? Right here. Built on the foundation of those who teach and preach for God. Built on that foundation. There is one faith that has been communicated to us by the prophets and the apostles. It's contained in the scriptures. We exist, Pastor Ellis and I and Pastor Ray, exist to explain these truths to you as the people of God. That's why we're here. And so it's built on that foundation, the Word of God, and that Jesus Christ Himself is the cornerstone. You lay the cornerstone and then everything that goes up after that is square to the cornerstone, it's plumb to the cornerstone, and that that is the measure of all things that are being built. And what is it that He's building? We're part of His household, but now built on this foundation, he says, we are a whole structure being joined together and we grow into a holy temple of the Lord. We don't understand this language. We are a holy temple. We understand the temple in Jerusalem. In the ancient world, the temple is the place where God actually dwelt. God lived in the Holy of Holies. That was God's address. You could send a letter to temple in, Israel, in Jerusalem to the Holy of Holies and they'd slide it under the curtain and that's where God was. Well, now the curtain's been torn in two. The wall has been torn down. God is loose in the world and we all have access to Him. And that the temple, Peter calls us living stones. God is taking Jew and Gentile black and white, male and female, slave and free, and they are living stones. And He is building with us individually a holy temple that we are all part of corporately. This idea of a Lone Ranger Christian, and you can be a Christian and not participate in the life of the church, is a lie from the pit of hell. That's not the gospel. This is the gospel. You're part of the church of Jesus Christ. It is the household of God. It is the holy temple that God himself is building. 
and you find your place in that building. St. Cyprian said, no man can have God for his father who does not have the church for his mother. He was quoted by Augustine. He was quoted by Calvin. He was quoted by Luther. The church historically has understood that you can't be a Lone Ranger Christian. But in our day and age, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Oh, I believe in God, but I, I don't go to church. I was at the uh, coalition a couple weeks ago, and I was talking to the lady as I was checking out. And she said, yeah, I've given up on church. All they do is fight. All they do is argue. I'm like, yeah, it's full of human beings. That's what we do. However, you can't absent yourselves from the rest of the body of Christ. You can't do it. That's the gospel. That's what Paul is preaching here. I think intellectually we understand it, but we don't understand it in terms of our volition, our will, and our desire to participate in the body. We have this idea that the church is some denominational structure, the Methodist church, the Catholic church, the Presbyterian church. It's not the church. The church is the household of God. It is a holy temple. What is the church? The people. When they gather together is the church. The people. And if the people are the church, what's that mean? That means that we are not purveyors of religious goods and services for you to come and consume. I don't like that church. I don't like its music. That's not what church is. Church is the people of God gathered together. And that you have a place. You are a living stone being placed by God Himself. For what purpose? You're not the audience for us to titillate. You are the performers to please God. You please God in your worship, in your singing. Sing with all your heart. You may not be a good singer, so what? It rejoices the heart of God. You do it by words of praise, by the sharing of your testimony, by giving thanksgiving for the good that you've been given. You come with your gifts and your offerings to God. That's what the people of God do for God because you're part of His family. You are a part of the church. It also means that we don't exist to serve you, and we are the ministers of the church. If you've got a pew Bible, and if you brought your own, look across the page at chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. I'm not the minister. And he gave to the church, Jesus gave to the church, apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers, and pastors to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Our job is to equip you so that you get your butts up out of the pews and go out and minister to the community and minister to one another. You're the ministers. It's not us. That's biblical Christianity. That's not cultural Christianity. That's not the way most churches operate. But that's, that's the gospel according to Paul. We are a household of God. We together are a holy temple, the people of God. Is that what we look like to people who look in from the outside? That's the gospel according to Paul. And the good news is this, that we share together in all of God's blessings. That together we're the children of God. Together we, we, are, we have an inheritance in Jesus Christ. Peter calls them God's great and precious promises, reserved in heaven for us and will not fade away. These are the gifts that He offers us as His children in His household. And He's building us together as the people of God. So in the first half of the chapter, you're dead in your trespasses and sins, but God has given us His Son, Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace through faith. We all understand that. But in the second half, no, you're alienated from God's people and you're hopeless and you're godless. It's the same gospel. But now in Christ, now in Christ what? He has torn down this wall of hostility that exists between people and that he is building it all up. And here's the implication for us as a household, as a temple. That you're to find your place in this holy temple of God. And you are to give your talents and your treasure and your time. You are to use your spiritual gifts for the building up of that temple as we are the people of God together. That's the good news of the gospel. Amen.